Now, the fruit of the Holy Spirit exclude violence against others. If we go after people's faith, it is irresponsible. Why? Because we put, in fact, Seventh-day Adventist lives in danger. And that would be reckless. We have to remember, we are a restorationist movement, not a sectarian violent breed of believers, closet terrorists in fact. So Mr. Ganun Diop calls some Seventh-day Adventists violent terrorists because they preach the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages, because they preach against Babylon. They preach against Popery. They preach against apostate Protestants. They preach against the apostasies of the SDA church. And these statements from Mr. Diop has now come forward since he met with Pope Francis several months ago. This presentation is a life and death matter. Let's get right into it. Greetings, salutations to Safe to Serve International and First Time viewers. Welcome to this Midday Power Surge. I'm your host, Andrew Henriquez. On April 9th, 2024, the General Conference leaders of SDA held their spring meeting. Various presenters, I'm simply going to focus on the presentation given by Ganun Diop, the director of PARL, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty. Anybody who listened to his presentation and actually agreed with him, you're either ignorant or you are a part of the problem. You are supporting apostasies in God's remnant movement, SDA. Let's get into it. Clip one. I'll get to Ted Wilson shortly because he approves of Ganun Diop's heresies and apostasies. Clip one. Now, the following presentation also is purposed to dispel misinformations and discourage the spread of disinformation accusing the GC of compromising the Adventist message. Hmm. The great question is, and friends, I put pen to paper today. This is so startling, not one word can be omitted. Who is accusing the GC leaders of compromising the Adventist message? Mr. Diop did not say. So I won't put words in his mouth. What has the GC leader said and done that have merited the protest which has been ongoing? If there was no protest, then Mr. Diop would not have done this presentation. Do you realize in the world, we have government leaders, very similar government leaders, the tyrants who are also using social media platforms to silence, to censor what they call misinformation, disinformation. What steps will Mr. Diop take to dispel misinformation, to dispel disinformation? Is he going to report faithful SDAs to the government? Is he going to report us to the tech giants? What, con what contacts does he have? What is really at stake is the credibility of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the public space. Hmm. These are questions that we need to ask. How does Mr. Dia plan to preserve the SDA name in the public space? How far will he go to do so? What would he not do to accomplish that task? Let me be candid. History will be repeated. In John chapter 11, 
verse 47 through verse 53. The Jewish leaders, and remember, that was God's organization, the Jewish church. The Jewish leaders actually put Christ to death. Do you know why? To preserve their name in the public space. History does repeat. The Bible says, if we let him thus alone, that's Jesus, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. We must preserve our name in the public space. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together to put Jesus to death. I want everyone to note this. It appears to me that P-A-R-L, this department, Public Affairs and Religious Liberty, will be one of the branches, if not the chief branch, the chief department in the SDA church, that will unite with the state to persecute faithful SDA preachers and people in order to preserve their name in the public space in order to silence people who are protesting against Babylon and protesting against SDA public apostasies. Watch out for this department, P-A-R-L. Without this diligent and proactive work of public affairs and religious liberty, we would not benefit, in fact, from several of our worship places in many countries. If Seventh-day Adventists are perceived as hostile, slanderers, accusers of others, and highlighters of what is wrong with others, instead of focusing on what is right with us, then people will pay us back by intentionally pushing back on any request from us. Any request from us. I'll come back to this. Watch carefully. When they said in John 11, the Jewish leaders, if we don't get rid of Christ, what did they want to get rid of? The voice of truth. The voice of revival, repentance, and reformation. The voice of solemn protest. Then the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. In other words, they wanted a place among the world. They wanted, they wanted a seat at the table of the world. They wanted to be accepted. So there must have been a department in the Jewish Sanhedrin organization that was concerned about public relations. Am I being clear here? And Jesus, they saw as a hindrance to that. We must get rid of him. History shall be repeated. Wait a minute. Maybe you missed this. Allow me, allow me to repeat. God. Without this diligent and proactive work of public affairs and religious liberty, we would not benefit, in fact, from several of our worship places in many countries. If Seventh-day Adventists are perceived as hostile, slanderers, accusers of others, and highlighters of what is wrong with others, instead of focusing on what is right with us, then people will pay us back by intentionally pushing back on any request from us. Let's be clear. Mr. Diop just said, quote, if SDAs are viewed as hostile, etc." Let's quote him correctly. Here's my question. Who views us as hostile and accusers, etc.? Mr. Diop did not say. I won't put words in his mouth. Why do they, quote unquote, view us as hostile and accusers. Let me be clear. If they view us this way, because we're living and preaching the three angels' messages, we should not be silent in order to get favors from the world. Don't be silent in order for them to fulfill our request. Mr. Diop, Mr. Trojan Horse, faithful Seventh-day Adventist, cannot be bought, we cannot be sold. Education, page 57. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. 
Men who will not be afraid to call sin by its right name. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. He said, if Seventh-day Adventists are viewed as hostile, accusers, your friends, dear friends, let me be clear. There are times in the Bible where God's faithful preachers were viewed that way. Put down these two scriptures. Number one, 1 Kings chapter 22 and verse 8. How was Micaiah, prophet Micaiah, viewed? By apostate Ahab, who wanted to be in bed with Jezebel and persecute God's people. He said to Jehoshaphat, there is yet one man, I quote, Micaiah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Why? Because he doth not prophesy good concerning me. He only prophesies evil against me. If the world views us, faithful SDA, as hostile accusers, we're in good company. Second scripture. What about John the Baptist? In Luke chapter 7 and verse 33, John the Baptist was called one possessed with a devil. We're in good company. And John the Baptist was not connected to the Sanhedrin Council, the Jewish organization of that day at the first advent. We will call that today the General Conference Organization. Not my words, that's the Bible and the writings of Ellen White. What will the PRL do to the faithful SDA preachers who continue to protest against their apostasies and uh, apparently obstruct them from having favors from the world, hinder them from receiving their request fulfilled? What will they do? What did they do to John the Baptist? What did they do to the, the disciples and the apostles? What did they do to Christ? Because of our representative system and votes, another organization cannot decide for us. Impossible. This freedom is therefore protected. No need to worry whatsoever. We Seventh-day Adventist leaders who mingle with this group, the Conference of General Secretaries of Christian World Communions, since 1957, we share our remarkable portfolios of services so that they know that we are assets to society. Mm -hmm. Friends, these statements and the movements of Ganun Diop are inimical to true Seventh-day Adventism, Bible truth, true religious liberty. Question. You see, friends, we have to interrogate Mr. Diop and those who support him. Why do the Seventh-day Adventist leaders have to mingle with, report to, and share their portfolio with an ecumenical alliance group since 1957? Because he said, quote, another organization cannot decide for us, so no need to worry whatsoever. As if he's saying, nothing to see here. Go along your business. Why do we have to share our portfolio with them? Next question. When did the SDA body vote for the PARL to join an ecumenical alliance and share our vision with this organization? When? Was there a vote taken? Who voted? For that, even if there was a vote taken to join an ecumenical alliance to say, let us do God's work, what does the Bible say? In the book of Ezra, chapter 4, look at it, verse 1 through verse 3, you had three apostates, Sanballat, Tobias, and Geshem. They came to God's builders and say, Oh, we worship the same God. Let us help you to build, to do God's work in the community. But what did the prophets of God say? You have nothing to do with this building. See you to it. Get away from here. Get thee behind me, Satan's ambassadors. And with that statement, look at the divine commentary. 
in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 282, paragraph 1 and paragraph 2. Again, I ask, why are we sharing our portfolio? Listen to me. The policies, the plans of the SDA church is being shared with men from Babylon. And people heard Ganon Diop's two presentations. One was video, that's what you're seeing now. The second one came after he was in person. And they nod their heads. We agree. Yes, we applaud your statements and your movement. Friends, let's get back to the Bible. Was there a person in the Bible that shared his vision, his secrets, his portfolio, his strength, with the pagans that was samson who was that now Sa hezekiah hold on with, with hezekiah that was samson i'll come back to hezekiah that was samson you preachers in the studio on fire today keep it up amen that was samson judges chapter 16 verse 6 verse 16 through verse 20 he shared the secret of his strength with delilah a woman represents a church, a pagan church. And who was behind Delilah? The Philistines, the Philistines that worship Dagon. Dagon, sun worship. Dagon, head was chopped off. Dagon, Dagon, palms were chopped off. The mark in the head, the mark in the hand. Popery, Babylon. What happened to Samson? Hmm? That's it. Not only Ganun Diop has this rhetoric, but notice this is Jan Paulson, a former president of the SDA organization. He writes, he's quoted as he wrote in the Adventist Review in 2002. He writes, stating to William Johnson, that other apostate back in the day, he says, you could read all of that. He says, we are a part of ecumenical alliances. Here's why. Others, quote, quote, John Paulson, others, including the Roman Catholic Church, are seriously taking note of who we are and are asking, what is it that makes the Seventh-day Adventist Church such a growing community? Therefore, says President Paulson, since they are saying, come talk to us. We would like to know a little more about you, John Paulson. We must be willing to talk with them. We must be willing to share with them, to share with the Roman Catholic Church, our vision and mission. And how many who sat in that spring meeting a few days ago, how many in the comment section says, uh, Mr. G Mr. Ganundiap is a man of God. GC leaders are men of God, the voice of God. Which God are you talking about? Not the God of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through verse 3. I told you, pen and paper today, a different way to present things. Nehemiah, when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, yeah, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet that comprised Babylon in the last days said, Come, Nehemiah, let us meet together in some village. We want to talk with you, Nehemiah. And I sent messengers unto them, said Nehemiah, stating, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down to talk with you. Why should the work of God cease to come and talk to you? My friends, let me tell you something. Babylon, Popery, Jesuits already know who we are. The devil knows who we are. And Popery and Jesuits are Satan's primary human messengers. Let that be clear. All right. By the way, Hillary writes in the chat, Luke 6 and verse 26. Woe when all men should speak well of you. So the question is, what was the threat in 1957 that caused the SDA leaders to actually say, we will share our portfolio with the ecumenical organization 
and leaders of Babylon. What was the threat? Ganon Diop didn't say in this video, but I'll tell you. The evangelicals in the 1950s labeled Seventh-day Adventist church as a cult. As a cult. We read of these men, Martin and Barnhouse. Look it up. It's in our history. So the question is, what truth did the SDA leaders renounce in order to be a part of this ecumenical alliance? That's it. What truth? You see, friends, I want to point you to this. These two books, Letters to the Churches. Come over here. Letters to the Churches. M.L. Andreessen. And this book called Questions on Doctrine from the SDA Publishing House. What's this? Adventist Review, Andrews University. Here it is, my friends. And what truth did the SDA renounce? They renounced the sanctuary message. They renounced October 22nd, 1844. They renounced the two-step process of the atonement. And they said the atonement was finished and completed at the cross. That's not biblical. They renounced the true nature of Jesus Christ, stating he was not touched with the sinful nature of Adam after the fall. My friends, that connects with victory over sin. Won't go there right now. They demoted the writings of Ellen White. So the question now, is... Now, the following presentation... The question is, who is really spreading misinformation and disinformation? Now, the following presentation also is purposed to dispel misinformations and discourage the spread of disinformation accusing the GC of compromising the Adventist message. You see, it's all about having the SDA name being credible in the public space. It's clear now. Mr. Diop and the GC leaders, all their allies, are guilty of treason. They're guilty of misinformation, of disinformation. They're guilty as traitors. They have renounced the faith. So the accusation and the firm remonstration that they have watered down, diluted, belittled the doctrines of the Adventist faith. It's a fact, not opinions. It's right here. It's a fact. It is not an opinion. Notice how this applies to the health crisis, the pandemic. Because remember, what is the issue here? The SDA church should have a credible name in the public. Watch this. Since 1957, we share our remarkable portfolios of services so that they know that we are assets to society, blessings to our communities through concrete engagement in, for example, health, including health clinics, education, university. So in order to prove to Babylon and uh, the churches of apostate Protestantism and the world that the SDA church is not a cult and is an asset to society. The PARL department, the general conference leaders promoted the pestilence 19 prick mandate and they misinterpreted and misapplied the writings of Ellen White to force the members of the SDA church to receive the Pestilence 19 inoculation. This is Ganun Diop. Listen to him. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Department of Health... Because remember, since there's a crisis in the world, Babylon says, let's get the churches on board. And the SDAs are saying, we must prove to them Yes, that we are with them. Oh, we are not a cult. 
The Seventh day Adventist Church, the Department of Health and the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department have supported and made it clear that the health crisis of the COVID 19 pandemic is a public health issue, not one of religious liberty. Despite this clear stance and the encouragement to get vaccinated, some church members have insisted by various means that the church should change its stance. Some request letters of exemption, uh, while being sensitive, of course, to the predicament and hardship of those who choose not to be vaccinated, the church has chosen not to issue exemption letters based on the prudence of not impinging upon the realm of state authority. The church can only promote actually what it officially votes. So friends, Ganon Diop is not the only issue, the only traitor. No, it's the GC leaders as well. They're implicated. Let's side with the state, but not with the members. And yet they say, we don't care if you lose your job and your business, but make sure you bring in the tithe and offerings. Now, personal conviction is not corporate responsibility, but corporate responsibility in the form of an official church position, such as, for example, the absolute right to observe the Sabbath, not to work on the Sabbath, not to take exams or to go to school on the Sabbath, is supported by international law and can benefit from accommodations and exemptions. This is not the case for the choice not to be vaccinated. No international law has been promulgated against vaccination. If you take these statements and apply them to the logical conclusion, you will deduce the following. When the mark of the beast becomes national and international, what would they say? No exemption letter for Sabbath observance because it is a national law to keep Sunday. It's an international law to keep Sunday. And people watch these videos and say, we agree with Mr. Diop. We agree with Ted Wilson. Apostasy, apostasy, apostasy is pinned on the church's doors. Health, and again, we cannot use the Bible as weapon. Now, let me just go here to say this. All this means that neither on medical safe ground, safe, uh, safety ground, nor on biblical religious ground, can objections to vaccines be justified. Doctors are qualified to identify cases when it would be... Enough. You can't use the Bible. Now, those words... And the same actions are actually coming from the Pope, who also promoted sorcery. Gracias a Dios y al trabajo de muchos, hoy tenemos vacunas para protegernos del COVID-19. Ellas traen esperanza para acabar la pandemia, pero solo si están disponibles para todos y si colaboramos unos con otros. If we collaborate, if we collaborate, and here is Ted Wilson the General Conference President and the Biblical Research Institute, Loma Linda. Here they are, my friends, misinterpreting, misapplying Sister White's writings. That is being disingenuous. That's too much of a tame word. They are liars, deceivers. And at the recent General Conference session, Ted Wilson stood up and said, let us not bring the issue of the pestilence 19 mandate for the inoculation, the elixir to the fore. We don't want to discuss it. That, but I want to strongly urge, and I have the consent and agreement of my fellow officer, Ayrton Kohler, my other fellow officer. Come on, speak up. Paul Douglas, that we stand united in asking this body not to put that issue 
on the agenda. Enough of him. Let's move on. Back to this. All this we do, again, without compromise. Let me be redundant here. All this we do without compromising our identity and commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It sounds so good. But the real question is, what gospel reveals our identity? It's Revelation 14, verse 6 to verse 12, the three angels' messages. It's Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. October 22nd, 1844, the investigative judgment. It's Revelation 12 and verse 17, the keeping of the commandments of God and the spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus Christ. However, the sanctuary, the Sabbath, the two-step atonement process, October 22nd, 1844, Christ's true nature as a man, were all denounced in 1955 to 1957. They printed the book, SDA's Questions on Doctrine. So what do we call this? It's a new organization. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 204, book it. Look at this statement here. What truths make us Seventh-day Adventists? The first, the second, and now the third angel's message. These truths make us Seventh-day Adventists. The second angel says, Babylon is fallen. Come out of her, my people. Come out? But what is Diop? What is the GC leaders doing? They're going into Babylon. That's chapter 18 of Revelation. Verse 2, verse 4, and also put down 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to verse 18. What fellowship has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial? What association has God's people with men from Babylon? Those who believe with infidels. Next paragraph says, if you don't heed the first message, you have begun a new organization. We cannot now enter into any new organization, for this would mean apostasy from the truth. Let me clarify something. These apostates want you to believe that those who are not a part of the general conference organization, they have begun a new organization. The real question is, are these groups standing on Bible and spirit of prophecy? If yes, they're not a new, modern, apostate organization. While those who claim to be in the organization have departed from the truth, they have the new organization, the modern apostate organization. Now, the fruit of the Holy Spirit excludes violence against others. If we go after people's faith, it is irresponsible. Why? Because we put, in fact, Seventh-day Adventist lives in danger. And that would be reckless. I'm not surprised. I did not believe so soon that we would see a time when faithful Seventh-day Adventists are labeled villains, are labeled violent Christians. Let's be clear. Let's quote Mr. Diop correctly. Because when you quote me, quote me directly. Don't misquote me. That's a lie. And thou shalt not bear false witness. Mr. Diop just said, quote, If you go after other people's faith, you are violent. Mr. Diop did not say, quote, If you go after other people, you're violent. Mm -mm. If you go after other people's faith, you're violent. Maybe you missed it. Now, the fruit of the Holy Spirit excludes violence against others. If we go after people's faith, it is irresponsible. Stop. Why? Because so based on Mr. Diop, 
in actuality he's saying then, if you take his statements to its logical conclusion, the three angels' messages are to be viewed as violent because it condemns false worship and false religion. It does. They do. The Bible condemns false worship and false religions. The spirit of prophecy condemns false worship and false religions. So by the logical conclusion, the Bible, the spirit of prophecy are all violent. Do you know who has the same rhetoric? Pope Francis. Birds of a feather flock together. Show me your company and I'll tell you who you are. Here's Pope Francis. Hear what he says. There it is, friends. He says that in various religions, you have fundamentalist, red words now, he says, a fundamentalist group, even if it kills no one, even if it strikes no one, is violent. And the mental structure of fundamentalism is violent in the name of God. Beloved, we have come to a time when fundamentals of Christian education, page 289 is being fulfilled by Ganon Diop and Terry Wilson. It says, when we reach a standard, the Lord would have us reach, worldlings will regard Seventh-day Adventists as odd, singular, straight lace extremists. Extremists means fundamentalists and terrorists. Do you know this actual paragraph? The words in the bracket are my words for emphasis. That has been there for years. I put that there and I did not know so soon. So soon I would hear from a GC leader that faithful Seventh-day Adventists are terrorists. I did not know it would be so soon. Listen to this from Ganundi up. We have to remember, we are a restorationist movement, not a sectarian, violent breed of believers, closet terrorists, in fact. Mercy. He called, called us closet terrorists, in fact. Let me tell you something. I want to be very candid. If I'm labeled such for living and teaching the three angels' messages, I'm in good company. Safe to serve international, you're also in good company. Do you know what they labeled Christ? A terrorist. In Luke 23, verse 1 and verse 2, they said Jesus is perverting the nation. What would we call that today? January 6, insurrectionist, extremist, terrorist. Are we together, my friends? All right. And what did they say to get Christ to be crucified? This man said he would destroy the temple in three days. You see my point now? So what would we call that today? If people were planning to destroy a public building of the government and church, you see my point? We're in good company. Though, although Christ was not an extremist, neither a terrorist. Acts 24, verse number 5, what did they label? Even Paul, the same. And we are told, listen, Ganundia, you are violent. You are terrorists. That's what he said. And people in the chat said, Mr. Diop is a man of God. Ted Wilson sat there and heard and watched this video presentation. Afterwards, Diop came to the podium and spoke. And not one hand was raised in dissent. What do you mean by these people are violent and terrorist? Explain yourself. They all sat there and they gave a run of applause. Amen. Next agenda item. Treason. And we're told in selected messages, pardon me, volume three, page 281. If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, is doing nothing in the case of an emergency. Indifference and neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded by God 
as a grievous crime and is equal to the worst type of hostility against God. Those who say, I agree with these statements, you are a part of the problem. And God will so move you out the way. So we should have nothing to do with the ways of evil, with the violence, with the accusing other people, but rather we are witnesses, not even God's lawyers, witnesses sharing the good news. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 34 onward, think not that I'm come to bring peace, right? But a what? A sword. If you accuse other people's faith, you are violent. My friends, here is my second star witness. It's the same theme from Pope Francis. Look at this. We have far more to fear from within than from without. These men are a Trojan horse. Pope Francis, there it is, friends. If you speak against my church, if you accuse someone's faith, you are violent. Here is the Pope. And you deserve persecution's punch. Here's Pope Francis. Hear what he says. Read the words if you don't speak his language. Abbiamo l'obbligo di dire con apertamente avere questa libertà, ma senza offendere. Perché è vero che non si può reagire violentamente, ma se il dottor Gasparri, grande amico, mi dice una parolaccia contro la mia mamma, ma gli aspetta un pugno. Ma è normale. È normale. Yes, you receive. Non si può provocare, non si può insultare mm -hmm. la fede degli altri. Look at that. If you provoke, if you speak truth about someone's faith, the Pope says you'll receive the Pope's persecution's punch. Watch this now. It all connects. Now it makes sense why Ted Wilson said to the World Church, we are going to print, publish, and distribute the book, The Great Controversy, and yet gave the book Great Hope a six for a nine deception. There it is. Now it makes sense. And what has been omitted in the book Great Hope? All right, a long list. I'll give you a few of them. The words Revelation 14 are mentioned 37 times in the complete book, Great Controversy. When I say GC, it's the complete book. In The Great Hope, only 16 times. Chapter 13 of Revelation, 19 times in the book, Great Controversy. Only one time in the book, Great Hope, Revelation 13. The word wine is mentioned 15 times in Great Controversy. One time in Great Hope. Babylon is mentioned 27 times in Great Controversy, only three times in Great Hope. Catholic is mentioned 45 times in Great Controversy, two times in Great Hope. The word papist, papists are mentioned, are combined 53 times in the book Great Controversy. In Great Hope, two times. The word sanctuary is mentioned 85 times in the book Great Controversy. In the book Great Hope, uno, and I don't speak Spanish. One time. I'll leave that with Carlos and Caesar, Spanish speakers. The number 2300 is mentioned 23 times in the book Great Controversy. In the book Great Hope, not once. Not once in the book, Great Hope, you find 2300. It makes sense now what happened in 1955 through 1957. Renounce the pillars of our faith to be accepted by Babylon so they won't label us a cult. The number 1844 is mentioned 35 times in the book, Great Controversy. In the book, Great Hope, not once 
1844. It makes sense what happened now. Do you see it now? Treason in high places. Come, come over here. Treason in high places. That's the nail in their coffin. And people are applauding this. Yes. Listen, the word Pope and Popery are mentioned 132 times in the book Great Controversy, the full book. My friends, in the book Great Hope, Pope and Popery cannot be found in the book Great Hope. Pope and Popery cannot be found in the book Great Hope. Sister White had a vision in dream. She saw a Catholic procession in a dream, a Catholic procession, yes? And they came to her house and said, this house is proscribed. The goods must be confiscated. Why? They have spoken against our holy order. A house could be literally where you sleep. A house could also represent a church. This church is proscribed. The goods, the books, the doctrines must be confiscated and silent and censored. Why? They are spoken against our holy order. Watch this. And since the protest went forward against the book Great Hope, all of a sudden, Ted Wilson and other GC leaders are now saying, oh, we want to push now the book Great Controversy. After they have been caught with their hand in the cookie jar, they have been caught red-handed. Their fingerprint on the crime scene is criminal against God. Sister White writes, terror seized me in the dream. I ran through the house. If I could only understand what's going on, if they would just tell me what I have said or what I have done. A Catholic order. Let's continue. I wept and prayed, much as I saw our goods confiscated, our books. What does Sister White have that speaks against the Catholic order? Which book did Satan attempt to kill Sister White hmm? and stop her from writing the complete book, The Great Controversy? That's the nail in a sure place. That's it. The goods must be confiscated. Back to the up. In fact, what happens in court, in a, uh, in a court, in a, uh, in a country? Out of all the religions out there, which one does Mr. Diop use as an example? He says, do not be anti-Catholic. Watch this. In fact, what happens in court, in a, uh, in a court, in a, uh, in a country, resulting in the incarceration of a union president and a treasurer was retaliation for aggressive anti-Catholic rhetoric in that country by Seventh-day Adventists. A judge decided to push back against Adventist leaders. Because of what? Don't be anti-Catholic. Now, friends, I have some questions to ask. What crime did the SDA leaders commit that caused them to be placed in prison? Mr. Diop did not share. So I will not put words in his mouth. My question, were they imprisoned for the truth? Well, if so, they should be encouraged because 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13 says, watch, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 and verse 13. And Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 says, Fear none of these things which you will suffer. Why? The devil and his human agents will cast some of you into prison for the faith, but be the faithful unto death. And Jesus will give you a crown of life. Watch the point now. Did Mr. D up in that presentation say he protested against the judge and the country? No, he did not. What Mr. D up said is that SDAs must silence the protest and don't be anti-Catholic against their doctrines. 
don't preach the truth. Now, in some countries, we understand what's happening. But the rule in one country should never be used as a template for all countries. That's on one hand. On the other hand, hear me carefully. Listen attentively. Let this sink deep into your ears, into your soul. Persecution will come to Protestant countries like America. Just as it has come to Catholic nations. So should we be silent? Should we be fearful? Watch this. Mr. Diop went all the way to this country to defend SDA leaders who were imprisoned on the grounds of religious liberty, P-A-R-L, public affairs and religious liberty. Yet, Mr. Diop refused to defend Seventh-day Adventist members who were persecuted for refusing the pestilence 19 prick on the grounds of religious liberty. Thank you, my brother. Elder Buchanan, that is hypocrisy, apostasy, apostasy, apostasy. Cry aloud and spear not. Isaiah 58 verse 1. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show the people their sins and their transgressions. Muslim countries, for example, with the ban on proselytism, are a case in point where it would be suicidal to attack them. Again, it is imperative to remember that core to our mission is to save lives. This also means the lives of Seventh-day Adventists who live as minorities in many parts of the world. What a flawed reasoning for someone who claims to have two doctorates, two doctor degrees, what, what discombobulated mindset that because in this nation, Muslim nations, if you are the minority, then be silent. So how will Christ reach Muslims? Now, I'm not saying we should not be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But to be silent, Jesus says, never we must stand for God while champions are few. Draw warmth from the coldness of others. Courage from their cowardice. Loyalty from their treason. Last day events, page 180 says that. Volume 5, page 136 says that. Question. So what will Mr. Diop's instructions be to Seventh-day Adventists? Listen, listen. When faithful Seventh-day Adventists become the minority, not only in Muslim countries, but the minority in every country. In these last days, because of the faith, present truth, and during the mark of the beast crisis, what will be his instructions? What will be the instruction coming from head office, headquarters up there? Washington, D.C., hmm? Bering Springs, Silver Springs. What will be the instruction? Be silent because you are the minority. Will we follow man or follow God? Scripture time, Bible time. Let's go and take a look at the 12 disciples. Were they the minority at the first advent? Were they silent? They were faithful. John the Baptist, the minority, but faithful to God. Acts chapter 4. Verse 18 through verse 20, Acts chapter 5, verse 28, verse 29, the apostles were in the minority, facing church power, state power, but they said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They were threatened, they were in prison, God's angel came, opened the prison doors in those scriptures and said, come out, come out, go and preach the same truth. But they were the minority. They were threatened. They were imprisoned. Those scriptures destroy Ganun Diop and Ted Wilson and GC leaders, heresies and apostasies. Go take a look at the book, The Great Controversy, 
and read the chapter entitled The War Dances. Were they the minority when Pope ruled the world? Did they stand for God even under persecution? However, were they wise as serpents? Were they harmless as doves? I'm not saying be extreme and be just foolish, but to be silent, never. Never, never. Volume 5, page 147 says, Death before dishonor or the transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. This next clip is a second part of Mr. Diop's presentation. Once he played the video, all those clips you just saw, then he walked to the pulpit, the podium. Hear what he says now. He calls the Roman Catholic Church a genuine Christian church. Hold on there. If I said that without proof, you would say that's misinformation, disinformation, I'm bearing false witness, I'm a liar. That means it's fake news. Stop listening to Andrew Enriquez, save to serve prophesy again. Let's hear this from the horse's mouth. The organizations that we have been attending as a church since 1957 is the Conference of General Secretaries of Christian World Communions. These are top leaders of other Christian denominations, secretary generals, and uh, all the major Christian churches are actually represented there. I mean, those churches which are recognized as genuine Christian church. Mercy. Who's on the list right there? Who's on the list? Look at the right column. In bold SDA, General Conference of SDA, just go up three steps. Roman Catholic Church. So because, listen to this. So because a global ecumenical organization itemize and say, you are genuine Christian church. You are a genuine Christian church. You are a genuine Christian church. Ganon Diop agrees. What does the Bible say? Which organization is a genuine Christian church? What does Great Controversy say? Watch this. Watch this. Great Controversy, page 571. Watch this. The papacy is just what prophecy declared. That she would be the apostasy of the latter times. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 4. Red words, Sister White writes. Shall this power, which power? The papacy, the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuits. Shall this power, whose record for a thousand years is written in the blood of the saints, be now acknowledged as a part of the church of Christ? Was the answer, no. By the way, I wonder if that paragraph is in the book Great Hope. Why was that expunged? As if they took the book Great Controversy and cut off the knots, the testicles, castrate God's word. What abomination. And now they're calling the Roman Catholic Church a Christian organization? Next paragraph, same book, same page. It says... Protestants are now aligning themselves with popery. There has been a change, but the change is not with the papacy. No, 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 no. Protestantism has changed. That means a change has come to the Seventh-day Adventist church. A new organization. First paragraph, top right of the screen. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Backsliders. Yes. Giving Satan's right-hand man, the Pope of Rome, the hand of fellowship. Don't play over there, please. Scratch them. World Communion, and here you can see the Seventh-day Adventist Church is recognized. Yes, we are not seeking approvals from other people, but being recognized 
as a genuine Christian church is important. There is no shame in being recognized of a Christian church. And that doesn't mean trying to please other people, but our credibility is at, is at stake. You see, it's all about the credibility of the SDA church in the public space. He keeps on repeating the same theme. Nothing is wrong with, with being recognized as a Christian church. The question is, who is recognizing you as a Christian church? Why are the majority of SDAs not critical thinkers? Who? Which organization is recognizing us as a Christian church? Next question. What true doctrines did SDA leaders have to renounce to be accepted and to be labeled as a Christian church? You see the questions we're asking? What true doctrines did we have to renounce? What heresy did you have to accept to be accepted and to be recognized as a Christian church? And why are SDA leaders seeking man's approval? You see, friends, in the Bible, who gave John the approval? Come on, get back to the Bible. John chapter 1. Look at verse 17 all the way through verse 29. Was John the Baptist seeking for approval and recognition that he was sent from God by Jewish leaders? By Herod? By Caiaphas? By Pilate? No! God's approved that Bible. Put down Luke chapter 20, verse 1 through verse 8. Christ did not rely on man's approval. And Christ said John the Baptist did not rely and seek for man's approval. Was he sent from God? Because when you seek man's approval, apostasy comes next. And I don't want to be extreme. First, seek, seek God's approval. And secondarily, leave the rest of man. But they're seeking man's approval. Why do I say that? Because you have to compromise to be accepted. Look at this right here. What is really at stake is the credibility of the Seventh-day Adventist church in the public space. Yes. In the same clip, notice which other church group were not labeled as Christian organization. And here you have the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists recognized as an official church. But interestingly, if you were to look at uh, this same organization, also identified other, uh, other communions that call themselves Christians, but are not recognized as such by the official Christian organizations. And if you can look here, you have worldwide communions and they are called with heterodox Christologies. And they are Church of Christ, Science, the Scientology, the uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, etc. even the Jehovah Witnesses. But you can see here uh, the work that, has, that some Adventists have initiated since 1957 was to make sure that we are not part of this list, that we are recognized as a genuine Christian church. May I ask you a question? That last bullet point, don't forget that. Because in 1955 and 1957, when we renounce Christ's true nature to be accepted by the apostate Protestants, so as not to be called a cult, when you change the truth of Christ's nature, you accept the Roman Catholic teaching of the Trinity. It's all about immaculate conception. I digress. I'll cover that some other time. So now notice, what other groups were labeled as non-Christian? So let me ask you a question. What if the world now says Sunday is the true day of worship? What will be the logical response? Go along with it because an umbrella organization is what is needed to tell us who are true Christians, who are not Christians, and Christians worship, right? C come on now, Christians worship. So this umbrella organization will now tell us what day is true worship, what day is not true worship. 
and whatever it says is true worship, every SDA must go along with it. Mr. Diop and GC leaders are willing to renounce truth to receive man's approval and to be viewed as credible and to call the faithful SDAs violent and terrorists in order to retain public credibility. Mr. Ganun Diop, let me be clear and speak to you right now. You are a modern day Balaam. And Mr. Ted Wilson, you are a modern day Balaam. Why do I say that? Balaam desired promotion, did he not? Balaam desired status from Balak. Balak was the state power. Balak also was a pagan worshiper, church and state. And what was the logical step of Balaam? To be promoted and to be accepted by the world. Balaam led God's people into apostasy. Balaam cursed God's people. What happened to Balaam thereafter? Numbers 22 through Numbers 25 and Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 through verse 17. Uh, I wanted to add one more uh, slide here, but I can just mention it. Ellen White says this, of all professing Christians, I quote her literally, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Jesus Christ. The preaching of the Sabbath is necessary and other truths related to it. But the great center of attraction should not be left out. And the great center of attraction is Jesus Christ. In other words, we should be champions in uplifting Jesus Christ. Next week, uh, I will be in Accra, Ghana. The Global Christian Forum is going to meet. As a matter of fact, they had asked me, a Seventh-day Adventist, to exegete John 17 and explain this text, of course, in the context of Christian unity. So a Seventh-day Adventist is presenting before other Christians the supremacy of Jesus Christ. See, so uh, the, uh, the, this is a miracle from God. When we mingle, in fact, it is not compromise, but it is being blessings to other Christians also in uplifting Jesus Christ in a unique way, in a good. biblical way. It sounds good. So I wonder if those meetings can be recorded. Let's really hear what Ganun Diop say about John 17. Let's all unite. John 17, right? Unite in Christ. In Great Controversy, listen to my points. Page 45 of Great Controversy says, if unity could be secured, only by the compromise of truth and righteousness. Then let there be difference, even war. Well would it be for the church and the world if these principles will be revived in the hearts of God's people in these last days. You see, friends, I'm not against preaching Jesus. But let me be clear. Step two, these, notice, let's preach Christ among Christian churches. On the surface, you shrug your shoulder, right? Yeah, come on now. Exactly. The Christian churches on the surface already know about Christ on the surface. Of course, we must take them deeper about Christ, victory over sin. But Christ gave us the everlasting gospel, which ends in verse 12 of chapter 14. They keep the commandments. Does that also bring the Sabbath? and the faith of Jesus. And what is the first angel of chapter 14? Yeah, verse six of Revelation. The judgment, fear God, the health message. Second angel, you are Babylon. Will Ganun Diop say, yes, John 17, let's all unite, but leave your Babylonian churches. Will he say that? Will he say you are Babylon? Friends, when Christ met the woman of Samaria, did Christ ever silence one word of truth? No, he did not. But he always spake the truth in love. But he never silenced one word of truth. Did he say, will he say rather what the mark of the beast is? Will he point to who the beast is? Who the image is, apostate Protestants? The beast, the papacy, what the mark is, will he? Will he? or just preach Jesus. If you only preach Christ, that's spiritualism. 
That's like Judas Iscariot. Lord, mwah, I love you, kissing Christ, yet betraying Christ. Listen what the Pope says and the apostate Protestants in their ecumenical alliance group. It's not my Jesus versus your Jesus, but it's now our Jesus. Do you see it now? Do you see why they want us to just preach Jesus? Let me be clear. Look who's present there, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Let me be clear. My friends, the Jesus of the Roman Catholic Church is not the Jesus of the Bible. The Roman Catholic Church's Jesus comes from immaculate conception. That means Mary never sinned. <laughs> Think about that. That's not biblical. In the Bible, all have sinned except for Jesus. That means Mary's mother never sinned. Mary's grandmother never sinned. You see my point? A whole lineage of sinless people, we do not serve the same Jesus. Christ's birth was supernatural, but Christ's mother had a sinful nature. We don't serve the same Jesus. I digress. That could be another message. And Diop is there. You see my point? And people cheer on Diop. Cheer on Wilson. Yes. These men are presenting truth. They're all on the same team. Show me your company. I'll tell you who you are. The two far left on the screen there. From Antichrist to brother in Christ. How Protestant pastors now view the Pope. Why is the Vatican flag being raised at the general conference session? The flags is the flag parade is called the parade of nations. Which to me it means, to me it means wherever the SDA churches are in nations, we will show their flag. What is the Vatican flag doing there? What is the Vatican flag doing there? The Holy See. Is there an SDA church at the Vatican? Malta. Even so, why are we parading? The Vatican, the Vatican's flag at the SDA church general conference meeting. They're speaking loudly to us. A change has come in the leadership. This is courtesy of Advent Messenger, Evangelist and the Roman, the most recent GC session. The Vatican flag again. After all the protests previously, they brought back the Vatican flag. It's right there in the yellow, yellow and white. Here it is. You could see the insignia on the white part yellow and white flag at the GC session what is happening among us uh, I wanted to add one more uh, slide here but I can just mention it Ellen White says this of all professing Christians I quote her literally seven day uh, you can see here uh, Bird Beach right and this was a meeting already in 1999, uh, again, mingling with other Christians is not uh, compromising. It is also to make a statement that we are a genuine Christian church. Bird Beach was actually elected as secretary of this organization. After him, he introduced John Grass, who became secretary. Again, what does it mean Organ or organizing one meeting a year where leaders meet to dispel prejudice. After John Grass also introduced me to, the, to this group and they elected me as the secretary. I organized a yearly meeting where I meet all uh, genuinely uh, recognized Christian communions. So you can see. Friends, let me give you a just a position. If you open a business, you have profit and loss statements, right? And if your business is not profiting, close the thing down. In ministry, 
in a sense, there's profit and loss, in a sense. If you're doing a particular uh, project, you want to see results. One question, how many souls have been baptized? How many churches of Babylon have been converted since Burt Beach, John Gross, and now Ganun Diop have been the president of this ecumenical organization? How many churches, not individuals, how many churches have you converted to SDA? Show me the facts. Give me results. John 10, verse 16. Are the sheep I have, Jesus says, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. They will hear my voice and follow me. One shepherd, one fold. From John Grass, who is Burt Beach? Look at that right there. He's saying these are genuine Christians, Roman Catholics. John Grass, the same one who gave the Pope the medallion. It's right there. John uh, Burt Beach. Hmm? And it seems to me the protest has fallen on deaf ears. That's the bottom right picture. John Grass and the Pope. John Paul II. And yet today we see Ganundiop with Pope Francis. Do you know what that means? The protest is being silenced in the SDA church. As long as people say, listen, keep, come on, keep on supporting the apostates, there'll be no change. Let me repeat that. As long as you hear statements such as, continue to support the apostates and don't remove them because God will remove them, it's all in God's hands. Show me the Bible where God did not send prophets to do his work. Hmm? As long as that rhetoric is there, you will never see a change. That's the medallion right there. There it is, friend. From Burt Beach, John Gross, and then to Ganundia. All right, there it is. Apostasy, apostasy. I wonder what school Ganundia went to. I wonder where he was educated. I wonder if his uh, 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 alma mater hmm? was linked to Jesuitism. Why is he still the PARL director from 2008, thereabout? Why has he not yet been voted out? I wonder why. My friends, because in the most recent general conference session, when they had the list of all department heads to be reinstated, Ted Wilson, GC president, and the leaders of the GC said to the delegates, you cannot vote on individual directors of each department. You can't do that. You must vote on the whole. That means if you have 12 departments, you must vote and accept all incumbent directors of all 12 departments. You either give an up vote for all 12 or a down vote for all 12. Where have you ever heard that? Why would they do that? Watch this. GC session 2022. Um, is it proper to discuss a specific per person at this time? Uh, I think it was made abundantly clear. This man is hinting at Ganundia. He will say it. It's a long video, so bear with me. I'm going to give you facts. Um, is it proper to discuss a specific per person at this time? Uh, I think it was made abundantly clear that we will refrain from making any comments or observation on names here on the floor. That was the understanding, Brother Jonathan. So okay. to your question, the answer is no. So all comments should be regarding the entire panel? Uh, you were given a chance to speak to the chairperson of the nominating committee, and uh, it looks like this did not take care of your concern. You are coming back to microphone number eight, and you would like to speak about a name. Unfortunately, this is not possible. Can I make a motion to have a name removed from the panel? 
this is not possible because we are voting this uh, the way it was presented, Brother Jonathan. One name. Then I would like to speak about the panel in general. You, you are allowed to speak about the panel in general as long as you refrain from identifying any department or any individual. Thank you. Okay, can I have my time reset? Let's reset the time for Brother Jonathan, please. Two minutes. I'm very concerned about this panel. Um, over, the, over the years, our emphasis on religious liberty has changed substantially. That's it. We started out defending Adventists and the problems they had, and those problems went away. As those problems went away, we started to defend other minorities and their problems. As those problems went away, we now have entered into social justice issues. And now we do things such as write amicus curiae briefs on behalf of the Open Societies International, which is a George Soros organization which has nothing to do with religious liberty. And this also sets the tone uh, for the entire religious me, liberty. Pa pa pardon me, Brother Jonathan, we have agreed that we will not allude to any department which would clearly identify a name. We had agreed upon that, hadn't we? And you have mentioned at least three times that you are talking about religious liberty. If we, you, we can agree to continue as long as we abide by this, Brother Jonathan. Enough. The point is made. Accept all. You cannot vote on one, on each. Accept all. Why would they do that? Watch this next clip. Oh. Sorely missed indeed. Mm -hmm. My comment is about the... Uh, you know what, friends? Even in the secular realm, if you have a business, you have something called analytics, and you go... Okay, for example, you have videos on YouTube. You want to see how each video does. What content is reaching your subscribers, etc. You don't look at the whole only. You go individual. When you go like this, vote on everybody, not individual department, not each person. You have something to hide. You are protecting a traitor. And those who did this are also implicated. They are traitors. Sorely oh. missed indeed. My comment is about the uh, concerns as a general category that are being expressed right now. These arise from our abandonment of the traditional way in which voting has been done in general conference sessions. Listen, listen. Obviously, in our rules of order, it calls for viva voce or via voice voting. I do understand that um, we have used other methods in the past However, um, this more or less arbitrary and sudden move to making everything a secret ballot leaves many questions in the minds of delegates that were not there when voting was being done in an open and transparent way. This method is not transparent. And there will be these questions and they will persist. I would suggest that unless there is a compelling reason All right, friends. Enough. to do... Again, courtesy of a few ministers here. Friends, let's close on this. I've gone over time today but I had to put the nails in sure places. My last point is going to be this, hypocrisy. Do you remember, I've been covering for the past several years, the woman ordination movement in the SDA church and how Ted Wilson and Mark Finley said, we can't stop the apostasies going on in the local churches, local conferences, and the local unions who are ordaining women to become pastors. We can't stop it. We don't have con uh, constituency authority to stop them. All we can do is disapprove. Question. If you really 
wanted to stop apostasy. Ted Wilson, Mark Finley, how is it that Ganun Diop is still PARL director, still holding our credentials and not yet been defrocked? Defrocked. Defrocked. Volume 5, page 14, page 15. They should be terminated. They should be discharged. How is it? How is it? You see, it's hypocrisy. You know what someone means, not by their words per se, but by their actions. Watch this. Oh, woman's ordination? Oh, we are against it. Ted Wilson, Mark, Mark Finley. We're against it. It's not biblical. We're against it. Mm -mm. They're against the vote. See, if the vote had said ordained, they would accept ordaining women as pastors. Oh, we are against it. Some would say, it's not biblical. What Ganon Diop has done, is it biblical? Is it biblical? It's unbiblical. It's an abomination. It's an apostasy. But you retain him in office with secret voting. And everybody must vote for all department heads. One time, up or down. And you cannot have questions on any one department and any one department head. We call that hypocrisy, abomination. Who do they think they can deceive? Only those who are drinking Babylon's wine in the local SDA churches. Now you can see why they'll put Jesuits and the writings of Jesuits in the Sabbath school lesson guide for the global church. Ted Wilson, Mark Finley, I close. We're talking not about individuals, but entities. Yes, sir. And I think that's an important distinction. If an entity consciously chooses to violate a voted church policy, and again, let's, let's define what a church policy is. A policy is a mutual agreement or a covenant that we make as the body of Christ of how we want to act. It is our best understanding of a topic at that given time. Listen. A policy is not doctrine. Okay. Doctrine like the Sabbath does not change. Stop right there. But policies Enough. can change. Doctrine like the Sabbath does not change. The Sabbath doctrine is actually connected with the fall of Babylon. Is it not? The Sabbath is in the first, the first angel's message. The Sabbath is in the third angel's message. Is it not? Hmm. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. So now they're saying, we are against everything, but we uphold doctrine. But Ganon Diop has violated doctrine and you retain him in his position. That's called hypocrisy. And it's the same Mark Finley who said, policy is not doctrine, policy can change. The same Mark Finley is on record saying, whatever the vote is from the general conference, accept the vote and get along with mission. If they vote to ordain women as elders, accept it. But Mark Finley, that's not doctrine. You said that's policy. Policy can change. And women being pastors and elders is not biblical. So why accept a voted policy that is unbiblical and say get on with mission? Whose mission? Who's what mission? if an entity chooses to violate a particular policy, Enough. whatever that policy is, consciously, Enough. because they feel conscientiously in not out of, out of harmony with that policy, okay? If they do that, they're on a slippery slope. Although the General Conference does not have constituent authority, because that union conference, etc., has constituent authority, here is the slippery slope. It's precisely the question you've raised. Stop it. Stop How it. then Enough. do you deal with others who may say, my conscience is leading me in tithe or other areas? So I think the question you've raised from a young person's perspective is a question that we wrestle with in general conference leadership because we don't have constituent authority. Each individual group does. 
And I think our concern is this opens the door for other open violations of policy in the area of tithe, in the area of certain sexuality issues that people are going to say, look, this is a matter of conscience. We can simply disapprove. We don't have constituent authority to make changes. You had the opportunity to make a change and bring in somebody else to represent the church. It's called public affairs and religious liberty. You had a secret ballot, up and down vote on all department heads. That's called deception. I close with these words. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. Many people are running from the lion, the bear, runs into the house, the church, the house, the church for safety, and are bitten in the house by serpents. In Matthew 23, verse 33 through verse 38, the closing words of Christ to the Jewish church were, you are serpents, you are generation of vipers. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, O Seventh-day Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist organization, you killed the prophets. You stone them which are sent unto you. Oh, how often would I have loved to gather thee as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but you would not. Behold, your house, your church is left unto you desolate. Beloved, by God's grace, I hope a solemn protest has been left in public, on the public record, that we, by God's grace, don't stand for heresies and apostasies. I hope you were enlightened. Your eyes were now open. Do not go back to sleep. But remember this. Don't just focus on these men. Some of them are not going to be saved. Some of them will be lost. They have already grieved God's spirit. Only a few are going to be saved, just as it was in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Only a few, and that's why I speak about this. Hoping to save one or two by God's grace. That's it. But the real focus should be on the people. The people in the pews, the focus. The focus should be training people to go reach people in Babylon, to go reach people in Babylon. Our work must be twofold, within and without. Let no man tell you, oh, because you're not with the conference, you're an offshoot of the devil. Are you following truth? That's the question. The Bible and the spirit of prophecy. People will say now to try to destroy this message. Oh, he's calling people out of the church. Let me put on record one more time. I've never told anyone to leave the SDA organized churches. Never. Neither in word nor in print, in writing. What I've always said, leave apostasy. What I've always said, support and champion truth. Therefore, if you find a local SDA church in the conference organization where the leadership is living and presenting present truth, support it. With your presence and with your funds, God's money, tithe and offering. If you can't find one, then if you can find a local church body that's not with the SDA organized churches, but the leadership are faithful to God, Bible and spirit of prophecy, support it with your presence, with God's tithe and offerings. But let me add, if you see a local SDA church with the conference and the leadership, not the people, the leadership are promoting apostasies in their life, adultery, stealing, false doctrines, in their life, in the pulpit, do not support it. Don't do it. With your presence and with God's money, you will be held accountable. And similarly, if there is a local church not with the SDA conference, 
and the pastor and the elder, the leadership, are promoting apostasy, adultery, lying, and stealing, money issues, robbing people. Their character have been sullied. Do not support that local church because many are independent for ulterior motives to support apostasies. Don't support it with your presence nor with God's money. I leave it there. Arise and shine. The protest continues. The Lord is coming. May we be found faithful, crying between the porch and the altar. Save your people, O Lord. In this one, I'm going to pray. Join me. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this presentation. We pray for the conversion of Ganundia, Ted Wilson, if it's not too late for their souls. Mark Finley, these elders, if it's not too late for their souls. And all the other GC leaders, if it's not too late for their souls. They have not yet grieved the Holy Spirit. But I pray for the members in the local churches, within and without, to have their eyes an anointed with heavenly eye salve. We know Satan's chief work, dear God, is at the headquarters of our faith. If the heart of the work becomes corrupt, oh Lord, the church with its various branches will suffer in consequence. May all of us be like John the Baptist. May all of us be like Elijah. May all of us be like Micaiah. May all of us be like Christ's disciples and apostles. May all of us be like Jesus. Save us, we pray. Save your people. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Maranatha, I'll see you tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern for Midday Power Surge. The protest continues.